I started uh, script writing around 2010 uh, and I submitted my script to the National Film Video Foundation. Uh, and a few months later, it came back with a five page critique to say, You're not a script writer, you're a journalist, but you have a story. And that's when I took it seriously. And then I did a six month training with the National Film and Video Foundation. And uh, ever since, you know, I started my writing. But, you know, from that period, it was very intermittent in terms of engaging in my writing because I was engaged in many other, my, my, my personal work, which is I have a, a media company. And uh, I also, during that period, uh, I was asked to serve on the Waterberg District Mayoral Committee. And uh, after that, in 2016, when I wasn't re-elected, I looked at myself and said, where to from here? And I decided that I should do, as I, since I loved writing, I should, I should write a book. And uh, I began uh, writing Reflections of a Kuli Bandit. It wasn't the Reflections of a Kuli Bandit initially. I mean, one of my nicknames is called Sanyopa, means troublemaker, loosely translated. So I thought about that. And uh, so I began writing the book. And it, I finished it around 2018, and around 2009, and, and I didn't know where to go with the book because, I mean, coming from a small town, we don't have the uh, interaction and, 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 and bouncing these ideas with, with many people. And then the highlight came when Ismail Wadi visited me in Mujibunle last year, in 2019, and he said he's uh, busy writing about activist in the throughout the country but if I can do is there anything is something I can submit for the Limpopo province. So I told this man I've I've written a book and you know I gave him a copy of the book and Ismail took it and about two three months later he called me and he says you know I went fishing and uh, I was bored because I wasn't catching anything. So I decided to read the book. I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. So Ismail read the book and he, say, he called me and he says, you know, you have a story. Can we start moving? And as many of you activists know, Ismail is the taskmaster. And that's the beginning of Kuli Bandit. Once I decided to, to write the book, I mean, I had to verify a lot of information. So what I did is, you know, I contact people that were close to me, uh, that I've worked with, those that were detained with me. Uh, there were three people that I contacted. Uh, one was uh, Mike Moazzi, who is better known as Spunky. Spunky, he came home one uh, evening and we, we had a discussion. And what I've done is, I, you know, tried to verify the information. Uh, the other person that was uh, detained with me was uh, Brian Mox. Uh, Brian was from uh, uh, Moshati in, uh, in, in Port Clitus, but working in Pretoria. And he gave me a whole lot of information about his detention. And the other person I interviewed was uh, Imran Lunat, uh, or Imran Hassan. You know. And Imran gave me, uh, we sat and we discussed the book, we discussed you know, uh, various uh, events that transpired during that period and you know verify those, those those because i mean it wasn't just my my view alone i mean i need to verify these things uh, and we we discussed it thereafter I, I i i wrote a book and then there were quite a few people that i had to give it to people that could uh, read it and get a feel of the book and tell me listen here this is a good or you know a shelf it so my niece who's in uh, in dubai uh, Zenith. She always loved my writing, so I sent it to her and she read it. Uh, incidentally, she read it on the, on, on, on the metro as she goes to go, went to work. And then a good friend of mine, Zainab, Zainab also read the book and uh, she gave me her input. And one of the people that did a very critical uh, read of the book was Ismail Vadi himself. And, um, and I've given it to a friend of mine, uh, Professor Shana Rasul from UJ. Uh, who read the book and you know did a lot of editing and that kind of stuff for us, for me. And the last person I gave the book, both Shahana incident, both Shahana and and uh, 
dancehall lady who I gave the book to read have given me acknowledgement of the book, like, you know. Uh, by the way, Dan also was detained with me in 1986. We shared a cell in 1986. And, you know, he was, I thought, the ideal person because he knew what our struggle was all about at the time. One of the things that I wrestled with was the title of the book. Because, uh, you know, it's, it's actually, I, I find, you know, coming up with titles and, head, and, 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 and uh, headings for your chapters, you know, very exciting. You know? Because how do you uh, encapsulate, you know, what you've written into basically two, three words? And I thought of it, and then I looked at, you know, uh, the coolie that caused all the trouble was one of the titles I thought of. Then there was uh, Sanyofa, which is my nickname that the comrades have given me in the township, uh, which means troublemaker, I think loosely translated. And then finally I came to Reflections of a Kuli Bandit. But then discussing with a few people, they said, you know, the title is too long. So, And eventually I landed up with the title Kuli. However, I must indicate that uh, the title didn't bode well with a lot of people because, you know, uh, understandably the term Kuli just like the K-word is a derogatory term. However, not justifying the term or using the word, or using the word Kuli, but I found that it was the ideal title uh, for that period. It was a very harsh period. It was a very abusive period. And the word Kuli encapsulates that period. And that is the reason why I use the term Kuli, you know, and I must say, for those of, of who feel offended, I, I would like to apologize because, I mean, I would never, as you know, in my, in my daily language, use the term. But uh, I think, you know, once they read the book, they will really understand why I use the title. I must say that a lot of people have inspired me to write this book. Uh -huh. However, I must indicate that my biggest inspiration was the African proverb that says, if the lion does not learn to write, the hunter will be glorified. And that basically is for us to begin to understand where we come from and where we're heading to. Uh, if we don't write our own tales, our own stories, and I'm telling you there are a lot of stories out there that need to be written. If we don't do that, then we're going to lose very important uh, stories, you know, which will not be captured for posterity. So I believe that, you know, that was my biggest inspiration. However, um, uh, for me is that a lot, of, uh, a lot of the comrades that I've engaged with over the time, I mean, I'm talking from I was 17 years old to now over 31 years, uh, years, you know, there are lots of stories to be told. I mean, for instance, when I came to Mudimulne in 1994, when it was safe for me to come back to my small little dorpy, I I went into the township and worked with Senko and all these organizations. And one of the things that I thought of is, I know I've spent one month in solitary confinement, but what is it to live in a shack? So a friend of mine had a shack and I said, listen, can I come and spend a night with you down there? So I did one in winter and one in summer. But also for me to get a feel of what the township is all about. I mean, like going early in the morning. I, mean, I normally have my meetings in Woody in the Shabin. And going early in the morning into the Shabin and seeing the surrounds of the Shabin and looking at old people coming to the Shabin to, to drink, those are stories to be told because that creates that, uh, that, that, that uh, the colorful tapestry of our South African stories. So for me, like I said, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's the, the community at large, uh, 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 now other writers, you know, I mean, a lot of Recently, a lot of books have been written by Uncle Isu, uh, Hassan Ibrahim. Uh, I've read quite a few of these books. And that also, for me, inspired me to write my story. But my story is about the struggle of a small town. Not many have heard about, uh, uh, about the struggles of small towns against apartheid. And these, the microcosm, uh, these small towns are a microcosm of the bigger fight, you know, of, in the, the, the cities undertook and that. So, so everyone had contributed. 
So my whole idea is to to write these stories, to write you know and capture them for posterity, uh, historically so, but also in a narrative manner, so that it is more palatable for for the youngsters to understand our stories. I mean, if you look, if we remember our 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 history, our history that was written by the colonials and 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 and, and apartheid uh, historians, uh, and you know it, it is their version, uh, probably a distorted version of our history. So we need to write our own history, and that writing our own history for posterity, for posterity is uh, my inspiration. Actually, the Kuli Bandit, uh, I reminisce about a lot of events that took place, you know, whilst I was in detention, uh, during my activism period, uh, also post-1994 when we became a democracy. Uh, what I think stood out in the book is the my, my time in solitary confinement. I spent one month in solitary confinement. Uh, believe him, it wasn't easy. Uh, you know, if people know, who know me and understand that I like talking a lot, so can you imagine spending twenty-three hours in a cell, uh, not being able to talk to anybody? <clears throat> and then the other thing was the uh, post the elections, nineteen ninety-four elections. I worked as a district electoral officer, and just and, and and just to get you know. A, a, a voting station was a tedious task because remember, I know those that were involved can remember that we have a very short period to prepare for those elections. So, uh, as a district electoral officer, you know, I had to go. For instance, there was a place called Rankins Pass, you know, in the rural areas, and I had to establish a polling station. There wasn't a piece of land where I could establish a polling station, and the closest was a police station, which was not the ideal place for a voting station. So I had to literally put up a tent and get someone to mend that tent, you know, and then the security involved. And then also there was a recalcitrant attitude of white people. They thought we were taking away their freedom, ironically so. So they were prepared to assist. Uh, for example, one person, the, the, the deputy secretary of the, the secretary of the town council, when I asked him to use a, a hall in, 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 in Pachaming, the township, he says, uh, no, you know, the ANC and Senka are using the offices behind, it might favor them. I said, no, I can ask them to vacate. The next thing I asked him, I phoned him, listen, they've agreed to go, uh, so can we sit and discuss it? He says, no, you're going to, the people are going to mess up the carpets. Now, I mean, I don't think they understood the magnitude of our elections. You know, that this is the democratic thing. To them is how best we can be obstructive in the process. And lastly is our post-90, post around 1991, 92, prior to 1994. I mean, the process of us taking a seat of power in, in, uh, in Mutimule Town Council, I mean, I write extensively about that also, was quite a very important period that stood out for me. First and foremost, I'd like to thank my parents and my brothers and sisters for their moral and financial support. I mean, without them, this book would not have been done. <clears throat> then I'd like to thank a lot of my comrades because this book will not could not be written without their, their stories or having met them, and for them voluntarily coming to me to give them to give the stories and. Um, and I'd like to remember, uh, and I'd like to acknowledge a lot of people. I mean, sadly, a lot of them have passed on, uh, you know, since I've written the book. You know, I can think of uh, comrades like Bungi Macheko, uh, Jacob Muima, Skara Kutumela, uh, my cellmate in solitary confinement, uh, Teenage Munama, uh, Abbas Sahib, Sien Kiselao, all of them have passed on. <coughs> and... Uh, you know, they've, they've fought a struggle with us. So, I mean, I need to acknowledge them. <clears throat> and uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, Ismail Vadi. 
I mean, Ismail Badi was the impetus to my finally publishing the book. If it wasn't for him, as you all know, he's a taskmaster. Uh, he really pushed me from the first time he got a copy of my book, a draft of it, and he really pushed me to to get this book going. And uh, a hearty thank thank you to him. And then uh, people that were involved with my niece Zinat uh, Hassam, uh, that's in Dubai, you know, for her support, Zainab Mir. Uh, she was oh she's she's always been there for me and 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 and, and reading my writings. Uh, my nieces and nephews, they literally kept my stories alive because I would relate these stories to him about uh, about what happened during apartheid. And for me, I found it very important that they, they understand where we come from, how our freedom came about. And then I'd like to thank uh, Shahana Rasul, uh, who helped me with the editing, uh, uh, Tualedi Tobayani, uh, who also assisted me with the, with the editing. As I indicated, to so was uh, was in detention with me, and um, then my brothers, you know, who have contributed to uh, to my having this book published. Uh, I mean, they've assisted me financially, <laughs> and I need to thank them for it right now. And yeah, I need to thank all the activists. Oh, I'm okay, not forgetting. I mean, uh, Rashid Sida, better known as Rash for you know, listening to my stories. I mean, I would phone Rash for the minutest of things and discuss it with him and he'd help me. Uh, my friend Abbas, Ayub Mayat, uh, he also, you know, I always bounce my ideas with him. And, uh, and Jeremy Karodia, uh, he too, you know, uh, uh, incidentally, hopefully, you know, post uh, this first project, we are looking at coming up with the audio and, you know, working together with Jeremy and, uh, and uh, others, you know, in coming with the audio book. Yeah. And yes, uh, my typesetter, who was very patient with me, uh, Roline Peterson, uh, she's really helped me and been, you know, always uh, been there to assist me. Uh, I must say, it wasn't easy because I've self published, this book was self published. Uh, and me, I had never had any idea about self publishing. So the, all these people contributed to my finally, you know, uh, publishing the book. Last but not least, I need to thank the Katrada Foundation. I mean, they were instrumental. You know, Shan, uh, Shaida, uh, Ismail himself, and all of the uh, all of them that uh, that are involved. You know, with whatever marketing and the b launch of the book, uh, I need to really thank them because they really were there to provide us. You know, as as, as novice writers, you know, with that uh, necessary impetus to begin to get work done and hopefully publish more you know, stories.